You're listening to Clara Anfo on Radio 1. I hope you're well and it's a beautiful sunny day wherever you're listening. This is just the beginning. Get to know if you don't know what. No one up you know what. You run it from the you know what. speak very long. This music's way too smooth. But how can sound waves physically make you move? And in return you get experiences you like. It lifts you. It's starting to look pretty small now. I guess the world really does uh... Be moved by the power of BBC Sounds. BBC Sounds, music, radio, podcasts. And go. So, welcome everybody. We have a really big audience tonight for this debate on the BBC and its future. And uh, do have questions. We will love to have questions from you to make it as interactive as possible. Uh, the event tonight is about the launch of a truly remarkable book uh, at the bargain price of Um, are on the side of broadly pro the BBC, Jean Seaton, professor, distinguished profession, professor of media and official historian of the BBC. Paddy Barwise, emeritus professor uh, of management and marketing at the London Business School, former chair of which and many other things. And then on the skeptic side, so-called skeptics about the BBC, uh, David Elstein, who has a run just about everything in television, former head of programming at both Thames and Sky, a founder of Brook Productions, founding CEO of Channel 5, much else, and then Rod Little, who you all knew uh, as uh, the best editor of the Today programme, and a regular columnist on the Sunday Times, Spectator, Sun, and many other things. Now, there are many questions that we're going to be looking at tonight, and just four of them, just four, are should the BBC exist forever? Should it make it into its second century, or should it just die the death that many people feel is inevitable? No institution lasts Forever, why should the BBC? Hardly anything that was existing in the 1920s is still going. Secondly, if it is to exist, how should it be financed? Uh, license fee subscription, a hybrid. Uh, thirdly, is the BBC biased? Uh, is it full of pinkos, weirdos, wokos? Um, and is that just now intolerable? Is it just a smug, um, uh, a, a, a smug North London uh, outlet? Um, and the dark winter, what might uh, lie ahead as the country is facing exit from the EU uh, post COVID that could we hear today go on forever uh, and ever? Um, the monarch, um, the longest serving in British history will not go on forever and ever. Um, what happens if we lose the BBC also? Now, uh, the panelists are going to begin uh, with just five minutes each, sorry, um, not five minutes, 400 words each. And I'm going to set my clock. And if it's um, in order, Paddy Barwise is going to begin. If it's in order, um, if I set the timer and I'm just going to clink my glass after they've been speaking for uh, two minutes, 30 seconds. It should be enough for them. Hope that's uh, fair. Hope you can hear the glass. Paddy, you all set? 
I am. Rock. Shall I start? Go. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Um, well, my book with uh, Peter York called The War Against the BBC comes out next month. And where we started two and a half years ago, the title looked a bit OTT, but it doesn't now. Almost everyone agrees that the BBC is in peril and that the attacks on it are deliberate, increasing and significantly driven by commercial and political vested interests. We need a calm, rational, but very determined response, exploding the myths with proper evidence. And that's what our book aims to provide. For instance, it's claimed that the BBC is still expanding, does too many things and crowds out commercial competitors. In reality, its real public funding is already down 30% since 2010, thanks to the cuts forced through by George Osborne after consulting Rupert Murdoch, but not the British public or parliament. Osborne has done more direct damage to the BBC than anyone ever, but he was one of the BBC haters seriously proposed as its next chairman until he withdrew because of the money. The truth is that the BBC has been getting smaller for 10 years in a growing market and with increasing content costs. And the crowding out claim has been repeatedly shown to be nonsense. What does need to change ideally before 2027 is the funding method as the TV license becomes increasingly anachronistic. We need an independent review to evaluate the options. I think David would agree with that, although we disagree on the best option as you'll see from our chapters in the book. The other myths are about bias, that the BBC's output is left-wing, anti-Brexit and woke, an American import. These claims come from a new US-style, very well-funded, illiberal metropolitan elite masquerading as the people. Bias is something of an inkblot test, but we have three types of evidence beyond individual subjective impressions. We have content analyses by academics, published in peer-reviewed journals. We have opaquely funded studies by right-wing think tanks and news watches, endless reports, claiming that the BBC's EU coverage is anti-Brexit. And we have what the public thinks. The public must be a great disappointment to the BBC haters. They keep consuming its services on an astonishing scale, an average of 18 hours per person per week, and despite relentless efforts in the dominant right-wing press to persuade them of its bias and untrustworthiness, they persist in trusting it far more than they trust any other news source. Paddy. Very frustrating. Going to stop you there. Very good. Um, so uh, thank you, Paddy. Just uh, uh, getting in there in the nick of time. Uh, Rod, um, over to you, please. I think the BBC is something of transcendental beauty. Uh, but it exists as transcendental beauty, in my mind, only in the past as a, as a form of nostalgia. And I think that what the BBC has to do uh, is hopefully ignore Patrick uh, and reconnect <clears throat> with those people who pay its licence fee and who, as you will have seen from that opening promotional video, it has moved further and further and further away from uh, over the last... 20 years, arguably 30 years. Uh, the obvious example recently was, of course, the last night of the proms, where the BBC dug itself into a pit and then continued to dig when it decided that no words were to be used for Royal Britannia and Land of Hope and Glory uh, because of COVID. Or was it because of the conductress who did not like those words? It turned out it was the BBC who did not like those words. And it was a kind of middle finger put up to Middle England. Uh, and that, that's one of the problems. Uh, Patrick talks about the bias issue. That the BBC is biased seems so incontestable as to be almost OTOs to go through the detail. It is not, it, it is not talking about the Newswatch people or, 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 or the right wing having attacks. How about the Wilson Report commissioned by the BBC? which said that the BBC was biased on the issue of the European Union. Uh, it did not mean to be biased, 
It just was biased. And that is the problem. That is the problem. If you want any more, there's also, of course, the Institute for Economic Affairs, which showed that during the Brexit debate, for example, 68% of those people speaking on question time and any questions were from a uh, pro-Remain point of view. And when you turn to the BBC reality checker, Chris Morris, uh, he also produced a programme on Brexit, of which, uh, out of all the many words expanded, only 7% were, issue, uh, were uttered by people who were in favour of Brexit. That's just Brexit. It's not really about Brexit, although Brexit is a good kind of uh, uh, um, a template for us to see how this bias takes place. The problem with the BBC is that it is monocultural. It is primarily arts graduates. It is primarily London-based, metropolitan. It is primarily middle-class. It is primarily white. Uh, and it is without question liberal. And on every single issue of the day, through its comedy, through its drama, especially those of you who may have enjoyed Roadkill recently, incidentally, by David Hare, it is extraordinarily hostile to any point of opinion which on social issues, not necessarily always economic issues, I would grant that, comes from what they would call the right. Rod? Yeah. Um, did you hear the pinging going then? No, I didn't. I'm sorry. Um, could you just wind that up? Quite quickly. Yes, uh, very quickly. There's a naivety at the heart of it. It's the not knowing which is the problem. It's that the people who work for the BBC do not know that they are politically biased. That's the main problem. They think it is merely decency rather than a political statement or a political point of view. That is the main problem which, which Tim Davy has to deal with. Thanks, Rod, very much indeed. Um, and, Jean, I will... Um... Thanks, Rod, uh, and thanks, Paddy, beforehand. I will interrupt you then, uh, Jean, after when you've got 15 seconds left to go. Jean Seaton, off you go. Um, the BBC is a success. Now that we're global Britain, why destroy the best bit of soft power we have in the world? The BBC does information, it does do decency, quite a good value, I think, and it does fairness. But in the modern social media world, it also uniquely does feelings and emotions. It's an institution. Um, institutions are very difficult to create and they're very easy to destroy and they can evolve and they have done and I think the BBC is one of them. In global markets, it has a unique and, and, and growable offer. Impartial, reliable, popular, good content. UK <laughs> built and operated, drenched in UK values. We need a confident BBC, not a boxed in, cut down one beside us to create a, and imagine us into the 21st century mm -hmm. is a real challenge at the moment. The BBC matters domestically more than ever before. Local press and reporting has been decimated. People all over the UK during COVID, as during foot and mouth, but this is a different order of crisis, depended on the BBC for information, solace and information. Bite-sized, the envy of the world, my inbox is full of people from all over the world saying, how did they do that so brilliantly, so quickly? Ordinary people, Beethoven explained, <laughs> lots of fun. By the way, the BBC employs more people outside London than in it, in Salford, Cardiff, Glasgow and Belfast. Belfast. Netflix is moving wildlife broadcasting to Bristol, beside Attenborough, beside the BBC grown natural world. That's the BBC operating as the attractant to world markets global Britain again. It matters to the UK as a nation more than ever. We are riven, we're in the middle of an unprecedented crisis and we need to understand and listen to each other. The BBC can be a positive force in this and VE Day and VJ Day were absolutely brilliant extempore moments. What holds us together is more important than what drives us apart. Fair, fair impartiality, kind-hearted laughing with people, not at them, strictly versus Love Island, anybody. And everybody still uses it, as Paddy said. It matters more to the BBC, to the UK and the world than ever before. What are the only institutions that anybody knows about, uh, uh, about Britain? I can tell you, I spent most of January in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh and there working. Um, the only things that are universally recognized are the monarchy 
the BBC and our scientists? Why would you throw one of those away? It matters more to the world than ever before. And this is a real information opportunity for us. Dis and misinformation are rife all over the world. Governments attack the media with impunity and undermine credibility. Safe information is like safe water, a necessity, and the BBC was set up to do this. 468 million people per week tune into the BBC. General Sir Nick Carter, Chief of the Defence Staff. Jean, Jean, I'm going to have to end you there. Well, I was actually told that we were going on slightly longer, so I, I just want to end on one thing. Very Nick good. Carter warned us about misinformation. The BBC is not a state agent, but is a, a thing that we could use in the world. And I think that Rod and David, I think it's a wrongly set up panel. I think Rod and David, both tremendously important journalists and administrators, are also patriots. And at this point, what we need is a bigger, better BBC with the room to do that, not a smaller, hedged in one. Very good. Thank you, Jean Seaton, very much indeed. Can I just say to everyone listening into this, there are over 600 people uh, apparently listening to this. It feels like there's no one listening to the four of us, uh, the five of us at the moment. Do uh, let us know you're there by sending in questions, please. Um, just get on uh, your, your screens, tap the messages in, uh, questions, however incendiary, let's have them. And if you want to put your name on and where you come from, that's better. And I will get your questions up if they're short and to the point. David Elstein. Thanks, Anthony. Um, <clears throat> it's odd, really. I mean, Rod and I are the only two panellists who have worked at the BBC. Um, so I would say uh, I would call myself not a, ske a sceptic, but a friendly critic of the BBC. Gene's quite right. It's a hugely important institution. And Paddy is quite right to uh, warn against people who want to do it down. But as it happens, <clears throat> I, I never believe for a moment uh, that Charles Moore would want to chair the Beeb, and I'm willing to offer long odds against Paul Dacre going to Ofcom, not that Ofcom's got any meaningful control over the BBC anyway. These kites are usually flown to flush out other candidates, and the Public uh, Appointments Commission chaired by Peter Riddle is far better positioned these days to insist on a proper process than when chairmen like Lord Hill, Duke Hussey or Gavin Davis were parachuted into the BBC. More importantly, whoever succeeds David Clementi will find a vigorous and newly appointed Director General firmly at the helm. Now, I don't know Tim Davey. I can recommend an excellent profile of him by Gene Seaton in the current issue of Prospect magazine. And he seems already to have grasped the key issues of internal culture, impartiality, and the need for the BBC to be much more streamlined with perhaps a 20% reduction in scope and scale to be welcomed rather than resisted. Funding, of course, is at the heart of the matter. The midterm review of the BBC Charter starting next year cannot touch the licence fee, which is guaranteed till 2027. But its survivability beyond then is open to question. Tony Hall, before departing from the BBC, mused publicly about replacing the licence fee with what he called a fairer system and a household tax was the most mooted option. The trouble is, if the licence fee were to transmute into a surcharge on council tax, even though that mechanism is only mildly progressive compared to income tax, it would create, in my view, insurmountable political difficulties. The level of surcharge on council tax required fully to replace the licence fee would be 12 to 13%, resulting in a massive north-south divide with 50% of households in the southeast finding themselves asked to pay from 15% to 125% above the current level of license fee. That's not an attractive prospect. Now, I strongly support public funding of public service content. News, current affairs, most of BBC radio, arts, children's, religion, regional and local output are not fully sustainable by market mechanism. So about half the BBC's current income will need to continue to come from public sources if we want those services. I prefer general taxation, but if a household tax is chosen, at least at the half licence fee level of funding, 
very few households would end up paying more than the present level of the license fee. Meanwhile, an entrepreneurial DG who has spent five years running the UK's third largest subscription TV channel portfolio is well positioned to work out how to generate the other half of current income by offering an attractive premium service of entertainment. If Tim Davy were to show winning, he could probably extract many important concessions from the sympathetic government, transition funding, underpinning of the BBC's pension fund deficit and so on. Question is, is he willing? Very good. Um, thank you very much, David. Uh, four excellent and pithy uh, statements uh, there. Um, and we're just going to come in with a quick question I'm going to put to each of you. Um, uh, Paddy, uh, who should chair the BBC? <laughs> oh, I think uh, I think that uh, Richard Sharp sounds actually rather well placed to chair the BBC. Who is? Um, uh, Richard Sharp, who's the latest name mentioned. But uh, and, and, it's and what, do you, what do you think the job needs, Paddy? Well, I mean, as with any chairman, you know, as former chairman of which, uh, you need to be uh, a genuine critical friend of the organisation who understands the issues, uh, but uh, doesn't try and sort of take the organisation off in a direction which is, uh, you know, to do with your own agenda. And the relationship with the chief executive, in this case, the DG, is the absolutely fundamental one. Uh, I think we have, as others have said, a very good DG now in place. Uh, who's going to do the right things and the chairman above all needs to be uh, Tim Davis' critical friend um, and uh, you know the person appointed to that uh, you know as has been said I think will come out of the Peter Riddle process. Uh, I think that the kite flying from number 10 uh, was uh, extremely unfortunate and may have discouraged one or two good people from applying uh, but you know with luck that sort of muddying of the water by, by Dominic Cummings is now, you know, being flushed downstream and we can have a grown-up process. Not just Dominic Cummings. Um, look at Manira no. Mertzer. Um, mm. And uh, thank you. So uh, your money is on Richard Sharp. That's who the BBC needs. Thank you very much, Paddy. Um, Rod, we hear all the time uh, that a new DG is appointed, that this is the most critical uh, appointment in history. Uh, is it really? Um, and what would you be doing if you are advising Tim Davy? I'm sure you are giving him uh, advice um, all the time. Um, right. I think uh, two, two things. Firstly, on the previous question, if I had a choice, uh, the uh, chairman of the BBC would be Trevor Phillips for three reasons. Firstly, the BBC has been very good at getting ethnic minority faces onto screen, uh, but it is not very good at getting ethnic minority face, uh, faces in positions of power. Secondly, uh, he's a bloke who has actually worked uh, as a producer, so he knows what he's talking about. And thirdly, <clears throat> he has a slightly stronger grasp of the BBC's wokeness uh, than uh, many other people do uh, and is able to address that. Uh, Tim Davy, I think, has made a brilliant start. Uh, his first start was to address the ludicrous business of the last night of the proms, which he did like that. So he could have been done, Tony Hall, remember that, uh, and cheered up everybody uh, as a consequence. Is it crucial for them? I think there was a time in January and February, when the guns really were sighted on the BBC, uh, <clears throat> not just by Dominic Cummings, who seems to have become a sort of uh, mischievous elf for the left wing, uh, who blame him for everything, which I think is fatuous. Uh, but undoubtedly, they were in the sights of the government at that point. I think COVID has slightly reduced that. I think there is a slightly greater appetite for the BBC, and I think it has had it has had a good war, as they may say. Uh, but it's still a crucial time for Tim Davy, yes, of course. And are we going to lose it? And does it matter, Rod? Oh, I think it matters if we lose the BBC. I think it will be appalling. <clears throat> Many of my uh, friends don't, I, I, and I accept the point from Paddy where, where he talks about commercial interests wishing to do down the BBC. I accept that. There are those. Uh, my, my problem is that it has lost touch with its audience and that when you do...
that, you end, you finish, you are gone. And it must get that back. Uh, Jean, um, thank you very much, Rod. Uh, when was the uh, high point of the BBC? When was it at its greatest? And who was the greatest DG and chair? Um, I, it's had many high points, but they've always been seen as also terrible points, you know, so the BBC is always under this kind of pressure. I think, uh, you know, Reith, the BBC actually was amazingly good during the Second World War and was appallingly led by the DG and chair. So it's it bubbled up from the bottom, that, which is a very interesting model. Hugh Cotton Green. Uh, yes. Wood. In the 60s. In the 60s, uh, you know, had a new vision for the BBC. Um, you know, Mark Thompson, um, Bert, these are all people who are very contested. But, um, so, and I think the key, the, the key thing I'd say about the, the chair, the, it, it often had chairs which it hasn't wanted. And sometimes they've been a really good thing. Like um, who? Uh, Charles Hill actually got rid of, who was, a Tory appointed by a Labour government. That's the television a, doctor in the Second World War, no less. And he'd, he was seen as very hostile. In fact, he turned out to, to do some interesting things. But it's best when you've got people like, you know, Mrs Thatcher's appointment after him was, an, was the vice chancellor of Edinburgh and was a very good thing because he worked very closely with Curran. So I think, and said that the chairman you know, the DG was in the driving seat, but the chairman was trying to read the map, trying to read the map, which is a good model. So, but they have to work together with some vision and some sort of critical view of where the BBC is going. And in my view, the thing that matters, and we do need to keep our eye on it, is that this process is a properly, is a properly done one. If you read Peter Riddle's, a wonderfully not a boat rocker, um, uh, 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 um, evidence to the Public Appointments Committee, it's on the Peter Riddle scale quite hair raising. So we okay. need. Um, hair raising, um, and who should we have as chair? No ifs, no buts. Um, somebody unexpected with vision and a capacity to like speak you. for the BBC and with big shoulders. Like you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I, uh, un unless I have a nominee, I'm going to put you down uh, as Jean Seaton self-nominated. Who would do it really good? Who does the historian think is the ideal person? OK, the, I, the, the nomination is that you get rid of people and other really brilliant people you haven't thought of emerge. I'm going to come back to you after David and I'm going to ask you've got three minutes two minutes there to think who you're going to come up with. David, uh, tell us either at the beginning or the end, uh, but is the best uh, of the BBC behind it now? Well, it doesn't have to be. Uh, the BBC has been pretty good at reinventing itself uh, at regular intervals. Um, it's not recognisable from the 1930s. Um, it's not that recognisable from the 1960s. Uh, it was certainly, I think Jean is right, uh, in its, uh, at its best in terms of dominating the landscape under Hugh Carlton Green. Um, and it was terrific in the 1970s and the 1980s. We've just had the uh, reminder of Play for Today and the Wednesday Play uh, and some of those uh, titles being repeated. And I can still remember really clearly watching things like The Parachute, uh, with John Osborne, written by David Mercer, and The Invitation Game, and so on. Um, it, it, but the BBC goes through phases, and it's um, been on the defensive uh, for a while, and it needs to recover its confidence, and maybe Tim Davey will do that. Um, uh, look, I hope that whoever is uh, emerges as chairman understands that the key relationship is not actually with the rest of the board, but with the Director General. When uh, Michael Lyons and Mark Thompson fell out, it was disastrous for uh, the BBC. Their public debate uh, about uh, executive pay uh, held at the Public Accounts Committee hearings was deeply embarrassing and an example of how badly things can go wrong if there isn't a a close trusting relationship between those two people. So I don't want to put a curse on him 
which I usually do whenever I recommend him for a job, but Trevor Phillips would fulfill the role really well. But there are other good people. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll get a candidate who wants the BBC to succeed. The notion that someone is going to be uh, injected into the BBC as a kind of, um, you know, sealed train uh, going into the Finland station, I, I just don't think it's going to happen. Right. Uh, thank you, David, very much indeed, and for keeping to time so well. Uh, Jean, who is your nominee, please? Um, I'm not, I, I, want it, I want it to be fair and open. I mean, I just, I just want a really good process. There's two things. The uh, BBC uh, always... OK, no, Jean, you've had your time. I'm not going to... Uh, you are, we are noting that you are not coming up with any uh, name at all. The historian of the BBC is not coming up with any name at all to guide us about the kind of person. Um, I'm noting that we have all uh, male nominees, uh, two for Trevor Phillips and one for Richard Sharp. And now sticking to our timetable, we're going to go through to questions uh, from uh, the audience. Um, and we're going to pick up here um, uh, about uh, Nick Jordan is asking, how can the new DG best address bias um, uh, and get straight on to it. Um, and uh, let's come straight in there with Rod. Um, what kind of, uh, uh, of Albert Hall, um, last night of the proms response do we need just to sort out bias once and for all? It's hugely difficult. The, the first thing, and, and this was mentioned in Richard Tate's investigation into the BBC back in, I think, around about 2002, I forget which, uh, which time it was, which is simply knowing this. You know, Tony Hall said that when people come into the BBC, they should leave their politics uh, on the coat hanger uh, by the door. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't happen. You know, uh, and in the real world, that doesn't happen. What they have to do is have a verstehen. They have to understand that the things which they think are not political at all are actually very political and that a lot of people don't agree with them. Now, how you do that, I don't know. The obvious answer uh, in the long term is recruitment. Um, and, yeah, I take Jean's point. Uh, that indeed the BBC employs people from outside the area, but they employ the same sorts of people with the same views everywhere. You know, there is there seems to be no one, for example, in, on Newsnight, who will say, well, hang on a minute, Emily, isn't this right? Instead, there seems to be no argument. And that's the problem which I think he has to, which, which he has to address. And it's never been as bad as it is now. It was a bit bad in my day. Uh, I would accept that. Um, but but it, it, it has become so progressive and so removed from the people it supports that it's very difficult to understand how it can change. Um, maybe a new chairman, maybe Tim Davey uh, will help, uh, but you need to dig in to that recruitment business and also to the to the stock of people who now work for the BBC. They are homogenous in their views. Out of 50 odd people on Newsnight, one voted for Brexit. That is the thing which has got to be addressed. I don't want the BBC saying we are pro-Brexit. I just want some equality. And who for you, Rod, before we go on, quick question, best yeah. embodies that spirit? Who gets it best? Uh, it could be an editor, a producer, could be a presenter. Andrew, right. uh, Trevor Phillips, uh, to a degree, Piers Morgan, you know, who is, is, is not a very BBC kind of person. Uh, but but he, I, I think he probably gets it as well. I, I, and I think those are people who do connect with the audience. Don't forget, the BBC got rid of Andrew Neil, just as it got rid of Jeremy Clarkson. You know, it does not like those people. Both mistakes? Yeah, bad mistakes. Absolutely. Um, Stephen Cole here is asking, I'm going to ask this one of Paddy. Um, Stephen is a former Al Jazeera presenter. This question came in before. Just to make that clear, it's increasingly clear, he says, the BBC is the architect of its own doubt and fall, more interested in social engineering than broadcasting. It's alienated its key audience. Paddy, what should the BBC do about that? 
Well, it's basically, I'm afraid the, the premise of the question... I thought you were going to go for the premise. Uh, ...is not consistent with what the data say. As I said in my introduction, it must be very infuriating, like, uh, I assume, Stephen Cole, to see the way that the, that the British public, despite apparently uh, having to, to put up with hugely biased stuff in, in the way that he appears to believe, in the way that, that Rod has, has represented it, that when they are asked, which source do you go to first for impartial news, the BBC is, is the one by a mile. Now, um, the architect of its own, uh, you know, destruction assumes that the BBC has lost touch with the British public, that's not what the data say. So <laughs> if you want to sort of look at look at this issue, you have to start off with the data. Now, that's not to say there aren't issues. There are two types of issue. One of them in which I do agree with Rod uh, is that uh, inevitably, uh, in terms of the internal culture, uh, there isn't the kind of diversity that there is in the wider population. I would say, how could there be? Um, if we say, which medium has a weekly transgender diary? It's the Daily Telegraph. If we say, which broadcasters, news presenters wore BLM badges? It was Sky. If we say, which organization refused to make a TV program in the state of Georgia because of its abortion laws? That's Netflix. Okay, so there is an issue, but let's not single out the BBC as if it's a complete outlier from all the rest. So um, I don't agree with the premise, yeah. but I do think that there are issues, there always will be issues. And uh, if you look at what the public thinks, then the cliche that people on the right think the BBC is left wing, people on the left think it's right wing, it is a cliche, but it's a cliche which is actually reflected in the data. Okay, and Paddy, quick question for a long server here. Do you think that there is less respect for independent academic empirical evidence than there used to be? And uh, is Trump, uh, has he helped create that if it's true or is he a, a product of it? Well, uh, clearly both. I don't think it's actually that true. So if you ask people who they trust, not just within the media, but more generally, then you know we professors and doctors and nurses are actually pretty high. And the people telling them not to trust the experts uh, people like to name but one Michael Gove are much further down. So I think that um, the actual reality has changed much less. Um, clearly, there are there, we have got a growth of populism in Western Europe and elsewhere, and um, populism is an anti-expertise and anti-academic thing. But I don't think we should sort of exaggerate the degree of change. If that is indeed what Michael Gove uh, meant. Um, well, but that's what he actually exactly. said is the British that's... people, very carefully, is the British people are fed up of being, which, and so his statement was actually a valid statement. Yeah. But in the sort okay. of hurly burly that's, of politics, um, that's not what people heard. Okay. Uh, moving on, uh, Jean, uh, Richard Crook has written in on the chat to say, I never watch the BBC, so why should I pay a tax? Is it fair? Um, well, in fact, my fair uh, point. Well, then let me just say, I had a, I had a, uh, my first husband had a mother, had a godmother called Peggy Pike Lees, of impeccable British values, who never watched the TV, and um, but always listened to Radio Three. And Peggy, Peggy's view was that she should pay the license because she liked Radio Three, and she wanted other people to, to, and she'd have paid a lot for it, and she wanted other people enjoy what they liked. So I think that there are things um, that people pay for, and the BBC is a very good example in which you, in a way, you pay in good spirits for what other people want. So this is a, this, this particular ask has been around forever. Um, and I think that more generous minded, uh, and as if I may say so, in a really critical moment in our position in the world, I mean, this, this isn't just a domestic issue. The BBC is actually a force for good in the world, and we ought to be worried about our position in the world. So there are many grounds in which you might will children to have British-made children's content. You might will school kids kept out of school, not served well 
in all sorts of ways to have bite size. You might will us to be part of the world. So my answer would be a loving, generous one. Come on. Um, you, 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 there must be something of it that you will in fact be using because most of your news will in fact have come from the BBC anyway. Thank you, Jean. Uh, very clear and, and uh, without hypothecated taxes, uh, much of uh, the tax that people uh, spend goes towards ends that they don't themselves benefit from. Uh, David, a question in from New York on uh, before uh, the programme started um, from Angela Anta Tomatu, if, apologies if I mispronounce your surname, Angela. Um, and she says, if we lose the BBC, we lose Britain's influence in the world and the soft power, uh, don't we? And uh, thinking in particular of the experience in the US without uh, the equivalent of a BBC. Uh, you've partly answered that, David, in your initial statement, but could you amplify? Well, look, the, B the BBC overseas is uh, immensely well regarded by uh, all kinds of people. I mean, it was very interesting when the Reuters did their survey of trusted news sources. Uh, the BBC came out almost top in the US mm -hmm. uh, above all other uh, <clears throat> media players, which um, uh, was <laughs> instructive. And uh, to be honest, uh, if the uh, World Service television, I always thought was terrible. World Service radio, I always thought brilliant. And it is a very important part of uh, UK foreign policy. Indeed, it ought to be funded by the Foreign Office. Uh, it's iniquitous that it is, um, you know, 270 million pounds worth of license fee money is being spent on it. But, you know, that's a battle that was lost in the past. We, we can refight it. Uh, what I what I do think is that the, the BBC needs to embrace the opportunities that exist in the modern world. Uh, you know, uh, 15 years ago, Netflix didn't exist in any meaningful sense. It's now in 190 territories. Uh, it has 100 and whatever it is, 40 million uh, subscribers. Uh, the, the BBC is at least as capable of producing very high quality content, which would be immensely attractive uh, all over the world. And uh, it's reluctant to do so because it hangs on to the license fee and the license fee requires it to make lots of content of a middling quality for a mass audience because everybody has to pay and therefore everybody's entitled to something from it. So. At the moment, it's missing lots of opportunities, which um, I think are there to be grasped. And maybe Tim Davey, who has spent the last five years working on all the BBC's commercial activities at home and abroad, will see the opportunity and make sense of it. It's, for me, disturbing that uh, it, it, the BBC is still talking to a very old audience. The average age of BBC television viewers is 61. Uh, young uh, children spend far more time with YouTube than with the BBC. Even 16 to 24s spend more time with YouTube and increasingly more with Netflix than they do with the BBC. There is a real danger of losing contact with the way people... Uh, uh, use media because the BBC is still, uh, in my view, quite properly concerned with its existing audience, uh, which is aging and largely conservative in the way it, it deploys media. But there is a big opportunity here, and I really hope Tim grasps it. Very quickly, David, uh, is it um, true that there are people in number 10 do you think who actually do want to do away totally with the BBC or is that um, uh, just a sham? Uh, do they merely want to see it fundamentally reformed? Look, it, there'll be lots of bluff and bluster coming uh, from certain people inside 10 Downing Street. They, there's nothing really they can do. Um, it, 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 quite a lot of the stuff that the Sunday Times has been running has been to kind of scare the horses uh, and try and induce people to do things. Uh, but if 
if Boris Johnson tried to do anything seriously to damage the BBC, he'd have a bigger revolt inside the Conservative Party than anything else he has done on COVID, free school meals, the North or anything else. It's absolutely not worth the political candle. OK, I'm, thank you for those responses. I'm going to ask the panel now one more question each, and I'd ask you if you could get the reply down to just one minute so that there'll be time for a closing statement from all of you. Um, Rod, I'm going to come in with you uh, first. And Mike Havelock says, um, why does the BBC hate white people and their culture? Um, and building on that, why should I fund a broadcaster whose content uh, treats me as an enemy? I think that is a question which an awful lot of people in Britain would ask, uh, even if they might not be so bold as to ask it in those terms. I think an awful lot of people in the country do feel that the BBC has moved away from the people who pay for its licence fee. And as David rightly said, the average age of the audience is 61. And yet the BBC, partly for commercial reasons, but partly also because this is what organisations do, and also because the BBC is gripped by this progressiveness, feels the need to court a youthful audience, which has a different cultural ideal uh, of how this country should be and what we should do with this country. And the BBC, the problem for the BBC is that it doesn't think, it doesn't believe that those cultural differences, and the culture war is now part of the uh, of our political battles, it doesn't believe that they are political decisions. But if they are, they, they really are. And those battles which the BBC believes has, uh, have been won have not been won remotely. Certainly they're in the minds of the people who watch the BBC. So it is incredibly difficult. And, uh, you know, I have some sympathy for uh, Mike Havelock. I think that is how an awful lot of people feel when they watch the BBC today and listen to Radio 4. OK, I'm going to ask Jean a question uh, here. Uh, Jean, coming in, um, uh, what um, this is from Mr. Uh, Shutif, um, uh, which is about the uh, London centric soft left attitude. Uh, come on. Um, um, uh, why does that continue? Wouldn't it be a much better BBC uh, if that was acknowledged and dealt with? Well, it's the same question as the last one. Um, I mean, I think there are at any given moment really difficult issues about getting uh, news coverage and general content in general, you know, in some sense balanced. And, um, uh, and those have to be rethought and radically, you know, reimagined every time. And of course, the BBC sometimes get, gets things wrong. I mean, it doesn't feel, I have to say that if you look at the other side, it doesn't feel soft left to the soft left. That's just, and I think the BBC has had a problem. It's a very simple news problem, really, which both Rod, I think, and David would recognise, which is that when you're faced with a political dilemma, one of the issues that you have to do is turn that into a news story and a question, not assign a political value to it. So I think the BBC politicised evidence in, in a way that's rather by saying which side of which argument does this evidence fall on that that's and therefore you in a sense politicize impartial evidence so I think that's that was unfortunate I think that's all addressable um and I would dispute that that's how it's seen I mean I know I watched I was in Wales for lockdown um and um I have to say that Cardiff has a goth bit of Celtic BBC values um, but it also is very in touch with, particularly with the valleys and with Welsh nationalism and those things. So I think that the very people who are complaining about London centrist, you know, lefty, just haven't been out and listened to what's going on in the country. So to Jane uh, Noble Knight's question, uh, uh, Jean, um, that about the BBC not recognising the concerns and taking decades um, to, to get to this stage, um, are we ready to lost cause? You you think that the BBC, this is a, a pre-submitted question. I did, I don't, Jane I don't, Knight. What, um, is it you, a lost you, think, uh, you, you think that the BBC um, uh, leadership has already addressed these problems? No, I, I mean, I think, I think that, you know, all really great things like democracy and impartiality have to be remade. You can't 
you can't carry them around. You don't get them right. And you often get them wrong. And if you look back at the BBC coverage during the Cold War, in one sense, it got all sorts of things wrong. In another sense, you know, everybody in Poland depended on it. Um, it, it uh, so I think, the, I think these are always remakeable. And I think these kinds of discussions are really important. Um, but one of the things that the BBC does is imagine it does creative work round children, round cooking, round, you know, round drama, round, round serials, you know, and some of that is how we imagine our way forward. And, you know, creativity is a very peculiar stuff. You can't pin it down. You just have to hope that it really blooms as in play for the day, which were incredibly left wing, never be allowed now, um, but very challenging. So I think that, you know, the BBC has to be left alone, not chivied and boxed in, but to listen to these arguments. And I am confident with the, the right governance and the right director general and enough money to do it properly, it can, it can actually be a really great new industry leader for us. It makes markets for us in every conceivable way. It's in our commercial interest for that to happen, both in that kind of industry and all of the rest of our industries. But it, it's that it's imperfect at any given moment is just what, you know, you, I, I would that I could be perfectly impartial. But Very good. I try very hard, and it's the trying which matters more than the thank action. You. Uh, thank you, Jean, very much indeed for that answer. Um, uh, David, uh, coming in here with Paul Conyu, media commentator. Uh, we're back to the appointment of the chair, inevitably a topical question. Uh, should it be given to an independent panel without any involvement uh, from the government of the day? No. no. Well, the, the government of the day doesn't have any involvement, um, as far as I'm aware. They can uh, mouth off as much as they like, but um, anyone who wants to apply for the job uh, can fill in the forms and do so. Uh, the applications are then uh, vetted by uh, a panel um, appointed by the Public Appointments Commission. Uh, those that get through uh, to the interview stage uh, are given exactly the same uh, opportunities. Um, you know, th there's no favoritism that can be, you, you can't put your, your finger on the spinning wheel in order to influence it. At the end of the day, when the commission comes up uh, with its recommendation, uh, it's not really like the Archbishop of Canterbury where you get two candidates and Downing Street chooses one of the two. Um, it, it will have been carefully managed to make sure that uh, whoever is recommended and is then put forward uh, to the House of Commons um, Culture Committee for interview. Actually, do they go to the Lords as well? I can't remember. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not really something that Bojo can do much about. Uh, and I'm glad of that because it would be the kiss of death to be injected into the BBC as some kind of hostile phenomenon designed to do damage. Uh, was, that's not good for your... anyone, not good for the BBC, not good for the candidate either. And uh, David, when was your golden era for the BBC? Well, I, uh, when I was there, obviously. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it, it went downhill soon after 1958. And, and one final uh, uh, question there. Can the BBC again capture uh, the talent of David Elstein and others in uh, when there's so much more competition? Yes. Well, it, it's not meant, it's not like that these days. Uh, the beauty of the invention of Channel 4 was the release of a huge surge of creativity as independent producers, hundreds and hundreds of small companies were set up. And people got the opportunity uh, to uh, do things in a different way. In fact, one of the most important reforms of recent years of the BBC was to hive off BBC production, BBC studios, so that the talented people working there could make programmes for other broadcasters. You don't wake up in the morning saying, 
what program can I make for the BBC? You wake up in the morning saying, what program can I make? Now, all over the world now, uh, UK creative people are in immense demand. Uh, it, you'll find that, you know, uh, The Crown at Netflix or, it, it, and it's not just uh, actors, it's writers, it's producers, it's directors, it's uh, technicians. Um, all the BBC has to do is tap into that pool of talent and pick outstanding ideas and make sure they can fund them. And that was what was so good about the old play for today. Uh, it wasn't, oh, Gene is right, quite a lot of them were quite left wing, but they're all kind of things. You know, the first Rumpole okay. was a play for today. So it, 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 the talent is there, the BBC has every opportunity to fish in that pool. And um, Paddy, I'm going to ask uh, you here a, a question, which is uh, the um, how to get the very squeeze, the very best uh, out of um, uh, the, 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 what the BBC has. What would you be doing yourself? What would be your recommendation? Oh, I've got nothing to add on that because they've already, they're already doing it. Um, one of the chapters in, in my book with Peter um, is based on a 2015 Daily Mail, Dacre's Daily Mail article, which claimed that the BBC only put half of its money into programmes, and we just sort of take that to pieces, piece by piece. I think that if you look at the extent to which it's had its funding cut, um, if the BBC's public funding had simply kept pace with general inflation, not with the increase in, in not just content costs, but distribution costs and technology costs, but simply with general inflation, since 2010, its income would now be nearly 1.4 billion per annum more. And that would give it the resources it needs, uh, you know, to do all these things. Now, how has it managed to soften the blow and maintain the quality of services as well as it has? Two ways. One of them is under Tim Davy, it's actually done, I think, a very good job at generating commercial revenue, which then subsidizes the license fee. But the other is that it now has overheads, which despite all the all the sort of right wing newspaper stories about taxes and goodness knows what, uh, it's it's in the top quartile for the industry in terms of low overheads. So it's got to keep, as, as David says, it's got to keep working to generate more commercial revenue. It's got to keep working to keep reducing uh, those overheads and getting more and more efficient. But it's very good already. OK, thank you, Paddy. We're going to take the final summing up under 30 seconds each and in reverse order. Um, David first. Well, I, I'm going to introduce a note of discord. I don't agree with Paddy uh, mm. on uh, the way the BBC spent its money. Uh, it's got f far too large overheads. Its distribution costs are too high. Its marketing costs are too high. Uh, it, it it needs a much more uh, ruthless attack on internal costs in order to boost the amount of money spent on actual first-run UK origination, which okay. is currently only a billion pounds a year out of 3.5 billion of income. So there's a lot more to be done there, but there's no reason why it shouldn't be done. OK, so rigorous financial uh, controls to get the most productivity. Jean? The BBC's... Most important value is that it's rooted in a universal service to us. That keeps its democratic to be a sort of pillar of British society. So I think people need to hang on to that because nearly all of the other proposals um, involve some way in which the BBC stops being the BBC. And absolutely brilliantly, I think Tim Davey has said, you know, we can make a great business of it, but being the BBC, which is universalistic, which means it's rooted in Britain is the key. Uh, Tim Dave will be very happy if he's watching this, which of course he is. Rod, your 30 seconds. Um, I'm a social democrat and therefore a communitarian and therefore I agree with a publicly funded broadcaster. And I think the idea of the BBC is an excellent thing. The problem is that whilst Paddy says that the BBC is adored by the public, uh, that adoration is diminishing by the year, as Mark Damaser, 
uh, former head of news, pointed out in a particularly vacuous piece in Prospect recently. What the BBC must do is try to diversify the opinions which it puts out, the, the sorts of programmes which it commissions, and its workforce in general. And if it doesn't do that, then it will alienate all those people who, at the moment, are beginning to feel a little resentful about paying 146 quid a year or whatever it is. Thanks, Rod. Paddy, 30 seconds. Uh, less than 30 seconds. Just look at the data. Don't just recycle these assertions from the BBC's enemies. Look at the data on efficiency. Look at the data on what the public actually thinks of the BBC. Look at the data on the scale of the BBC in people's lives. That's my bit. Uh, I thought that was four uh, really uh, pithy uh, contributions. You didn't pull your punches. There wasn't too much um, odious um, uh, familiarity and, and agreement, consensus, hate all that stuff. Um, uh, thank you very much to all four of you. Can I just say at the end that on the 5th of November, there's another uh, event uh, with Mark Thompson and John Curtis. Do tune in for that. Do, if you haven't already in the last hour, ordered several copies or more of the book. Um, and finally, uh, then please do. I'm going to be asked to adjudicate between Paddy, um, uh, who has uh, got a cat but not smoking it, uh, and uh, Rod, who is got a cigarette under the counter and uh, is smoking it, and it goes towards um, it goes actually towards Jean and Del and David for thoroughly healthy lives without cats or indeed um, which are expert philosophers or indeed uh, cigarettes. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you very much you. to uh, the technician, to John Muir for setting it up. Uh, excellent. And join next week and buy the book.